Welcome back to Heritage War Sirens. So I've been asked by one of the followers to do a sort of uh, stats and facts on the uh, CS6 siren here, uh, which we will go through today. But I thought what we could also do is maybe delve into the history of where dampers first came into use on the uh, UK air raid sirens and the reasons behind that. And maybe a bit of history on the, the siren designs themselves. So we will do some facts and figures. We'll cover the uh, CS6, the GP8 here and the castle castings so these are all cold war era ones um, and hopefully you guys are enjoy as early as the first world war with the zeppelin attacks happening across the united kingdom with bombing runs on towns and cities air raid warning devices were being installed in urban areas my hometown of dover for instance a large steam whistle was installed on top of one of the factories which the locals affectionately called lizzie and they would sound this off when there was an incoming attack during the build-up to the Second World War in the late 1930s, with the outlook of hostilities outbreaking looking more lightly and the advent of modern bombers and fighter aircraft, the UK government decided that a much more comprehensive air raid warning system was required for the country. They ran a series of trials in 1937, partnering with a number of different manufacturers to test different models of air raid siren to see which would be the most effective. Gent and Co. of Leicester tested their 8 horsepower version and Carter of Nelson submitted a vertical 20 horsepower air raid siren. At the end of these trials, the Home Office selected the Gent and Co. of Leicester 4 horsepower horizontal model air raid siren which had a 10-12 port design, the 10 port producing 475 hertz and the 12 port producing 570 hertz so this would give the siren a dual tone. Recommendation was given to local authorities by the Home Office to use this particular model of siren. It was installed in towns and cities across their districts. And later in World War II, Carter of Nelson introduced their five horsepower version, which was also added to the recommended list. At the start of the early Cold War period, Sigamax Service Electric also introduced their five horsepower version. But all three of these sirens were horizontal 10-12 port designs and this design stayed right till the end of the Cold War in the early 1990s. Each of these sirens was given a designation by the Home Office, the Gent & Co of Leicester was given a designation of 1-L, the Carter of Nelson became 1-N and the Sikamak Service Electric became 1-S. Later in time, Carter of Nelson would be taken over by Castle Castings during the Cold War who would carry on producing sirens until eventually they closed down. Sikamak Service Electric, eventually their siren division became Klaxon Signals and they do still make air raid sirens to this day, although the only versions they now make is the GP6, GP10 and GP12. So at the start of the Second World War, the air raid warning system was in place. It could do two signals, the alert red, which was a wail or the rising falling note, which meant raiders incoming and people knew to get under cover. And it could do the raiders past or all clear signal, which was a continuous tone, and people knew it was safe to come out again. This worked well all the time we had large formations of bombers coming over, which could be picked up by radar and ample warning given out to the population. But later in the Second World War, with the fall of France bringing the Germans much closer to the UK shorelines, that brought about new problems. For my hometown of Dover, it meant the Germans had brought their guns right up to the French coastline and could now fire and shell the town without having to send any planes over. So these shells would land, hit houses, land in the middle of the street and cause carnage and initially there was no warning signal given for the shell warnings. Eventually Dover was given special dispensation to make a new signal which would be two blasts of continuous with a gap in between. This would be the new shell warning and would work okay at night time when they could see the German cross channel guns muzzle flash and they knew had about a minute before the first shell would land in the town. 
but unfortunately during the daylight hours usually the first shell would have to land before they could activate the signal to warn of possible further incoming shells. On other parts of the southern coast there became a new problem with tip and run raids so rather than sending large formations of bombers which could be easily detected, a single plane would leave the French coast. It would stay low level to avoid radar and detection and then arrive over a town in complete surprise, drop its bombs and then quickly fly back out to sea and disappear. So by the time the explosions had gone off, the warning had got back and the air raid sirens had finally been sounded, that bomber was already on its way home and the raid had already finished. This is where they knew they made it, needed to make a new signal and the cuckoo signal was invented to warn of these tip and run raids and this is where dampers first appeared on air raid sirens in the UK. So the previous two photos show an experimental set of dampers fitted to a gents of Leicester ARP model and these dampers were activated by the levers running on the outside of the siren that almost looked like an exoskeleton design. And these were connected back to a set of solenoids driven by relays. These would be activated by a signal sent down a new pair of phone lines installed by the GPO. And for the cuckoo sound to work, firstly a signal would be sent to the siren, the all clear continuous signal and the siren would start up, it would take about four to five seconds to go from standstill to full speed. And then a signal would be sent to the solenoids to open both dampers simultaneously, so the siren would start to make noise instantly. After a few seconds, both dampers would close again and cut off the sound, and this would just be cycled, hence the pulse or cuckoo. This could be activated separate from the air raid warning system, so local lookouts on top of factories and other tall buildings would spot the incoming plane and this signal could be sounded straight away without having to go through the usual warning network meaning warning can be given much quicker for these quick tip and run raids Moving forward to the Cold War period, they once again visited the idea of using dampers to sound different signals on the air raid sirens. So to supplement the existing attack red and all clear white signals, two new signals were suggested which were fallout grey and fallout black. And both these signals would be sounded using dampers on the air raid sirens. And the reason behind this was just because an area hadn't been directly hit by an atomic blast, they could be downwind of somewhere that was and fallout blowing downwind from that area could still have catastrophic effects on the people there. The grey signal would have taken over the cuckoo signal of both dampers opening and closing at the same time giving the pulse signal of on off and this would warn of fallout expected in the area within one hour. The fallout black signal would use both dampers again but they would work alternatively with one open one closed cycling with the two different rotor ratios causing a high low signal or a ninor through the siren and the idea of this signal was to warn of fallout arriving imminently. In the end both these signals were scrapped through the siren due to cost of installing dampers on each of the 7,000 sirens dotted around the UK and the associated uh, telecom equipment needed to be installed to operate them. In the end the fallout grey signal was dropped altogether and the black signal was kept but it was signalled via the Royal Observer Corps and they would fire three maroons from their monitoring posts which were dotted all over the United Kingdom. So these three short bangs in a row would indicate fallout is incoming. So we'll start our stats for this siren. This is a Seekamac GP8 or General Purpose 8 air raid siren. Uh, this one's a later Cold War model. Uh, but the Seekamac Electric Co Limited was founded in September of 1930 and their first model air raid siren was approved for use in the early Cold War era and given the Home Office designation 1-S. 
So this later model, it still conforms to the standard 10, 12 port design. So the 10 port side producing a tone of 475 hertz and the 12 port side producing a tone of 570 hertz when it's running at full speed. Uh, the motor on this one, it's a 3 kilowatt, 4 horsepower, uh, three phase induction motor. So it's 415 volts uh, and runs on our frequency of 50 hertz over here. And the motor has a rating for 15 minutes of continuous running um, and the build materials on this one on the later Cold War the base is cast iron uh, the motor body and flanges are steel and the uh, rotors and stators on either, either side are cast aluminium uh, the sirens overall length from the end of one rotor to the opposite side there is 55 centimetres. It's got a width of 40.5 centimetres and stands about 44.5 centimetres from the bottom of its base to the top of the stators. Uh, weighs in at around 85 kilograms, this one, um, and the rotor diameter is about 37 centimetres. So a couple of design features unique to the Seeker Max sirens. Uh, the first one was the uh, port edge here. So on the Seeker Max, even from their earliest model, they were chamfered in at this angle, um, whereas the Carters and the Castles and Gents always had a uh, flat edge to their uh, porting. So if we hold up a Castle uh, 10 port next to it there, you can just see the flat edge on the port compared to the Seeker Max um, angled edge. And the difference really, it was a slight improvement on airflow. The only sound difference it really makes at low speed, the Seeker Max do sound a bit throatier, whereas the uh, Castles and the uh, Carters have got a much smoother sound. The other difference would be how they balance their rotors. So on the uh, Seeker Max, they would drill bolts through and add weights to the rotor to balance them, which we can just see inside down there. Whereas the uh, gents and the castles, they used to drill material actually out the back of the rotor there and remove material to balance them. So moving on to castle castings, uh, the only one we have in it at the minute is actually being stripped down for restoration at the moment, but we've got the main motor from it here. Um, as you can see from the um, stator that I held up there, we did have the difference on the uh, slots on the uh, porting on them there. Um, there also was a slight difference on the motors, as in the motor on the castles was slightly more powerful. So where the uh, Seeker Max are 3 kilowatt, uh, we can see on this one, uh, just on the motor rating plate there, they're 3.7 kilowatt motors in these. Uh, so it has a slightly higher ampage of uh, 7.2 amps per phase, whereas the Seeker Max 5.8 amps um, the rpm on these is ever so slightly higher so 2840 uh, so there's 20 more than the seeker mac uh, but again it's the same um, three phase 415 volt 50 hertz motor on it uh, the port arrangements are exactly the same at 10 and 12 port producing the same dual tones so this is the seeker mac cs6 or coded siren 6 the coded meaning it has the damper on it and can produce an extra signal. Um, I've been asked in the past on this one why, why I have half an air raid siren, um, but this was a genuine model um, and it's got just a single 10 port uh, which produces 475 hertz tone. Um, they made these for areas that didn't need um, such uh, a large coverage. So this one came from the Portsmouth docks area. Um, but sometimes in factories and other areas like that but they didn't need to alert an entire town um, a single ported siren would do so the specifications on this one the motor on it is a bit smaller it's a 2.2 kilowatt um, three phase 415 volt induction motor on it um, they could get away with a smaller motor on this as it's only driving one port and there's less air resistance so they didn't need so much horsepower in the motor on it um, it's got an overall length from the end of the damper to the back of the motor of 70 centimetres. The width is 43 centimetres and it sits about 44 and a half centimetres from the bottom of the base to the top of the stator. It has the same rotor width again of 37 centimetres on it. Um, the rotation speed on this one is the same as the GP8, so it's 2,820. As I say, once it's running at that full speed, that's where it's producing the 475 hertz tone. The solenoid on this one, it's a single phase 240 volt um, solenoid, and that's what's used to activate the damper via a lever inside the tube. Um, and the way these dampers worked, 
when the uh, damper is closed, it blocks airflow going inside the siren. So even when this is spinning at full speed, uh, it hasn't got the air pressure to produce the tone. As soon as that damper opens, the air rushes in um, and it can produce its sound instantly. So this was used for that uh, pulse um, effect. Uh, she weighs in just around 80 kilos, so only slightly lighter than the uh, GPA, even though it's only got a single um, port uh, and a smaller motor. But the weight of the associated damper and the solenoid gear in there um, brings its weight back up again. So we've opened the solenoid uh, box up there just so we'll be able to have a closer look at the mechanism that drives the damper. Uh, but just before we look at that, um, one part that hasn't been reinstalled in this siren since it was restored um, is the heating element. So we just look at that. Um, it's a one kilowatt element and this would usually have sat just in front of the rotor um, inside the casing here. Um, and the reason they had these um, in the UK, the winters could be quite cold. Um, so if rainwater had got in between the rotor and the stator and then frozen overnight, um, if they tried to activate it, it could actually lock the rotor in place and cause damage to the motor. So uh, thermostats were installed uh, near the siren on the poles. Um, and when the temperature did drop, um, these heating elements would kick in on sirens across the UK. Um, just to warm them up and stop that freezing action. So moving in just a bit closer, we can see the main electrical connection box for this siren, and it's got a lot more um, outputs on it than you'd see on other styles of siren. Um, the reason for this, you had the mains cable coming in, you'd also have the cable coming in from the thermostat to control the heating element, you'd have a cable coming out to run that heating element, and then you'd have another cable which would be coming out to run the uh, damper as well. And if we just go in a bit closer, we can see the original maker's plate on top. So we've got the CS6 uh, model number there. And as you can see by the serial number, there weren't many of these made. They're quite rare sirens. And in fact, this is um, just one of two that are known in uh, private collections. Um, so unless anyone else knows of anyone, uh, and then please put it in the comments below. So just moving in closer onto the damper mechanism there, we'll be able to see how this operates. So it's a 240 volt um, solenoid down the bottom here with the uh, plunger here. And when electricity uh, is passed through this, uh, the magnetic force will pull this plunger down. Um, and as you see, if I just do it with my hands, you'll see the mechanism move. And just here at the back here um, is the rod which goes inside the tube, which is actually operating the damper. So what we'll do, we'll put some power through that in a minute and uh, we'll see that going. So looking directly down inside the damper tube there, we can see the damper's currently in the closed position. So we'll just uh, give a push down on the solenoid there. And you can see that's where it would flip open. You can actually see the rotor inside. So that would usually be uh, spinning. Um, and uh, once that's open, the siren would be making its uh, full sound. So I think we're finished today's video there, um, keep an eye out for some new uploads coming soon. So we'll have the uh, next one in the Castle Casting Restoration series coming up soon. Um, and I think we'll finish today just with an all clear signal from the uh, GP8 here.